Hi, welcome to the Julie Rose Show. Today is Monday, September 9th, 2019. Hi, Eric Smith. Hey there, Julie Rowe. <laughs> so here we are again, third podcast in less than a week. Yeah. Trying to meet, trying to meet this, um, I don't want to call it a goal, but this bit of a, a deadline that we feel like the Spirit's given us to get this podcast out tomorrow. Yeah. So hopefully we'll be on track for that. Um, well... The long-awaited multiple probations, yeah, or what some might call the doctrine of eternal lives. Mm-hmm. Now that is a well-accepted term in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So, you guys, this is what we're discussing today, or at least some of it. We know or feel like we'll have at least three podcasts on this, potentially more. This is just going to be kind of an introduction, and we're going to see where the energy goes. We've discussed a little bit between Eric and I. Uh, we didn't feel like we wanted to have anything like exactly laid out. Uh, we're going to follow the same format basically that we've done on other podcasts. So, um, Eric, I'm going to turn it over to you to to do what you do best with our podcast to kind of lay the doctrine out there for us. Okay, thank you, Julie. Multiple probations is one name for it. Another um, scriptural term for it is estates. And um, these these terms just have to do with how many lives you live on the earth. It's um, not to be confused with the doctrine of reincarnation, right? I believe the churches, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, is official position on reincarnation is probably that of Bruce R. McConkie is recorded in Mormon doctrine, which says it's a false doctrine. As far as I understand, Julie and I are on the same page on that. We believe that it's a false doctrine. And why, Julie? Well, because I've always been female and I've always been human. I've never been a butterfly or a caterpillar. And if I screw this life up, that does not mean I'm going to go be a dog or a cat. Right. <laughs> so, once human, always human. And um, if you're female, created spiritually, or male, then you are that gender. And it doesn't change based on your actions. You cannot change your gender in this life or on the other side of the veil. Well said. Uh, you know, there's some movies that are out. There's a couple of movies that are produced by that Christian film production company. I've really enjoyed them. And they're about a dog. I think a dog's journey. And um, in that, it, it shows the representation of a dog, a dog's spirit that comes back as different dogs. Um, in each Mm -hmm. of its probations. And And that actually happens. Right. (laughs) Animals can come back as the same type of animal again. I, and, and, you know, the spirit touched my heart as I watched that and I felt the truths in it. One thing where, where I feel like they got off was that the dog came back as a female and a male and it kind of switched. And so I, I believe that doctrine you, you proclaimed on gender applies to animals as well. Is that true? It does. Yeah. Yeah. That's my understanding. So, having said that, I when I first started researching this and trying to understand it, I had the impression that Heavenly Father, on the other hand, can give us the opportunity to know what it's like to be a dog, to know what it's like to be a leaf or blade of grass or whatever, a butterfly. I don't know how he lets us do that, but I believe that he, he lets us experience those things so that we can sympathize with nature and cre- his creations better. Do you have anything to say on that? Um, well, I know when I was in the, have been in the spirit realm that those, the blades of grass and the trees and the animals and even the water, um, told me that they love me and that they have, that they're intelligences and that each, each organism has spirit to it. And, um, and so I, in feeling their love and feeling their emotion, I, I have come to some of an understanding in that way. I can't say that I fully understand what it would be like to be a tree, and I don't know that I ever will because I'm not a tree. Mm. But I do often feel the emotions of of those organisms, of those living intelligences. Mm. But um, some people might find this weird. I uh, same thing happens with my coffee table or the walls in a hotel room or any of that. You can feel the energy of who's been there or who is currently there and of the actual intelligence that makes up the elements or the elements of, of what cre- is created. Yeah. So I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, it does. It answers it. 
I mean, if I told you that my coffee table told me it was sad, that I didn't appreciate it, people would think I'm weird. <laughs> but it did. <laughs> I was complaining about it when I lived in Iowa and I was doing a session and all of a sudden I looked over and I felt this sad energy coming from my coffee table like, ooh, I didn't expect that. I, huh. yeah, I hurt the feelings of my coffee table that I you know, don't appreciate it like I need to. So. Huh. That's weird, interesting. Huh? I don't think it's weird at all. Well, if we if we continue to lay out the doctrine of multiple probations, um, I think some some fundamentals to understand is that this is this is not a popular doctrine in Christianity. It's uh, it is a popular and well embraced doctrine in Asian cultures and some other countries as well. But um, it's and so let's see. So it's not discussed in the scriptures to a wide extent. Although I do want to show at some point in this that there are scriptures that reference it. There, um, it was preached early in the days of the Restoration by apostles and by uh, Eliza R. Snow and some other key foundation figures in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, and for whatever reason, it was. An untouched it was put away and shelved I believe that the brethren understood it and felt it was a sacred doctrine and shouldn't be out in the general understanding and and then I've I've come to feel on my own that after some time it may have even been lost and not discussed widely even among the brethren to the point where we are today where it's just generally not understood or discussed or even believed as a doctrine do you have any thoughts on that um, I agree with you. Okay. When in the early days of the restoration, there were so many doctrines that were being restored, and there was a lot of in, in, excitement and enthusiasm. And one of there's one example I want to point of this when when Joseph Smith revealed that a man and a woman could um, be baptized for their kindred dead ancestors. There was a lot of enthusiasm, and people immediately ran out. I learned this from Truman Madsen. Um, immediately ran to the nearest river and men were baptized for women and women for men and there were no records kept and Julie pointed out that they didn't even um, you know do confirmations on a lot of those so there wasn't a lot of order. They either, they either didn't do confirmations or in some cases they did confirmations for the wrong sex. Right. <laughs> And so just mismanagement, disorder, but a lot of enthusiasm. Misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. And which is to be expected uh, in a new doctrine. Um, so so over time, policies, procedures were implemented. They, they were taken into temples and so forth. I, I mentioned this because I feel the same thing will happen as new, as old doctrines are being restored still and President Nelson has alluded to the fact that um, not all doctrines during the restoration have been revealed yet and that's a basic seventh article of faith we believe all that God has revealed all that he will yet reveal many great and important truths pertaining to the kingdom of God and so um, so we know that more doctrines will be revealed this is one of them I I've come to believe that the that um, when Joseph Smith said to the saints, if I were to tell you all I know of the kingdom, there are men on this stand who would seek my heart's blood or seek to kill me or whatever. Um, it's been made known to me that he had multiple probations doctrine in that in mind when he said that in addition to other doctrines. What, what do you think, Julie? I absolutely agree. Um, when I had my near-death experiences and was reminded of these doctrines, and mind you guys, I've had six mm -hmm. and a lot of out-of-bodies and a lot of communication from the other side um, by the light side and, quite frankly, by the dark side who tries to abscond the truth and, um, and twist and turn what is being revealed. And um, that's exactly what I was told. Absolutely, Joseph Smith knew this and he taught it uh, to a few and it is so sacred, um, and the saints just really weren't ready for it. And, and I, I have seen, you know, with some of the people that have revealed some of this stuff online, as it's gotten back to me on LDS Freedom Forum and some other websites that I'm not going to name, you guys know some of what they are, they are getting bits of truth, and they're also getting mixed messages from the adversary and distorting the truth. And I can't tell you how many people 
clients and other people have come to me and said the spirit told them you know they were x y and z that they did x y and z premortally or that they were so and so on the earth way back in the time of christ or whatever we're going to talk more about that in upcoming podcasts about some of those things that i've been told as a war strategy we need to put out there to let you know that if you're being told some of these things uh you're being talked to by the dark side mm -hmm. somebody masquerading as a, as a light person um so it is very sacred doctrine and and in part that's because it's at the crux of the plan of salvation and eternal progression and so um knowing your divine potential knowing your divine identity not just that you're a, a male or female but that you come from a heavenly home and that you are on track to return to your heavenly home and that there is a process in which you are to undergo in order to have eternal progression and go wherever you want to go in your eternal progression um of course the adversary's got his hands all over it mm -hmm. there's no way it's it's right at the core of creation and divine worth and it and so he's going to twist and turn at every turn in any way that he can and these um demons and unclean spirits that are masquerading as light angels and even as christ are very crafty uh, i can't say that enough so i hope that we will open your hearts and minds to this doctrine but also give a very very strong word of caution that in so doing as you learn this it will open you up to both the light side and the dark side and if you're going to receive truth then you need to expect to receive opposition regarding that truth the principles are the same the eternal laws are the same opposition in all things and so i can't emphasize enough keep your hearts and minds open and also be on guard for the opposition that's coming to you as you listen to this podcast and in the coming days good this good. is one of the reasons we've waited so long why i'm five and a half years into my mission and just now talking about it uh like this right good good point julie I have two other foundational um, bits to, to get us going here. The first is that we live in the Telestial Kingdom. And when you read DNC Doctrine and Covenants section 88, you get a real strong sense that the laws of this kingdom pertain to this kingdom. So if we have, say, you know, 60% light, then we're going to get 60% laws of, um, that match the light that we have on this earth. As we advance into a terrestrial kingdom, maybe let's just say we're 80%. These numbers have no meaning. I'm just throwing them out there, but 80% light. Therefore, we have an increase in, in glory, in light, in knowledge, in laws, in principles in, um, that match the degree of light that we have there. And then same as you advance to the celestial kingdom, you have new laws, new glory, new light, new conditions. So... With that in mind, we can't assume that in a telestial sphere, this earth has all the light, knowledge, glory, ordinance, covenances, and so forth that exist in the celestial kingdom or even the terrestrial kingdom. Therefore, as we advance through those glory, those kingdoms, new light, new knowledge and understanding will come to us. And, and so that's what I see coming when the Savior returns. We'll be in terrestrial conditions and there's new light that comes with that. I feel like that 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 transition's already started, and that's why these these higher doctrines, might we might call them mysteries of the kingdom, have started to be revealed to us. Julie, right? Thank you. So premortally we made covenants. Some people made contracts with the adversary, and premortally we made covenants. Those covenants are part of our eternal progression. Then we come to Earth, and many of us enter into new covenants. That's where baptism comes in. That's where initiatory comes in, endowment and sealings. And then when you pass to the other side of the veil, or in rare cases on this side of the veil, someone receives their second comforter, second anointing, translation, or on the other side of the veil, there's ordinances tied to that, like the calling and election. Most people receive their calling and election on the other side of the veil. It doesn't just happen on this side of the veil. In fact, it's very rare on this side of the veil to receive your calling and election. We do not, quote unquote, seek after calling election, second anointings or second comforters. It was most likely, in fact, every every understanding I have is that if it was part of your plan to receive that and you continue to make righteous choices, that will come when it's supposed to. We do not force this and 
And anybody that subscribes to the idea that if you do X, Y, and Z, then you're going to get your second comforter, I would be cautious about. Yeah. Same with second anointing. These are such sacred doctrines and sacred ordinances that um, if somebody is going around telling you that they've received their calling election or their second anointing, I guarantee you it, it didn't happen. And the way I can guarantee you is because instruction that comes to someone when they receive that is that they do not go and especially publicly disclose it. And if they are, there's some pride involved in the individual, which tells me that probably the officer got a hold of them and was trying to, you know, puff them up and make them feel like they're super righteous and stuff. So when people have received their calling election and they know that they have, there is an instruction from the spirit realm that says this is to be kept very sacred, more so than a patriarchal blessing. And the same thing with second anointing. Now, for instance, with with the 144,000 that received the sealing in their forehead, that is also an ordinance, and that is um, specific. I'm not going to go into details with what that what that's about. Those individuals do receive the second comforter and second anointing, and will receive translation if they haven't already. Again, very sacred. And when those people are set apart for that, it's unmistakable. It's not just an angel and somebody pretending to be Christ. Those that come will do so either as resurrected translated beings that will come and and those that administer that will be set apart by Christ himself. And so if you have somebody that has come to you and said that they can give you blessings because Peter, James, and John came and set them apart to help translate translate people or give priesthood blessings for certain parts of their body so they can be trans, it's a false spirit. If you have somebody that's telling you that um, Christ came and told them that it's time to live polyandry or polygamy or anything else, false spirit. It has not yet been restored. And when it is, that is for translated and resurrected beings. And I can't caution that enough because the minute people find out about multiple probations, the first question they have is as men, you know, it was revealed that they can be married to more than one man. And as women, I can't tell you how many people want to know, well, does that mean I have more than one husband? Does that mean I can be sealed more than one person? What happens to my husband? Do I have just one eternal companion? I can tell you, we're going to get into that more on another episode, but this will open you up. And there are people that would love to tell you all kinds of lies regarding this doctrine. Julie, I just want to point out, you, you did just say a, one, a man could say be married to a man. I, I know you didn't mean that. Oh, sorry. Or, yeah. No, no, no. Married to more than one woman. Sorry. Right. No, I did not. No, 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 no. Yeah. Sorry, we can't cut this video either. No, 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 no. Thank you for catching that. No, no, a man cannot ever be married to a man in the eternal realms. Mm -hmm. That doesn't work that way. Man and women, you cannot create Earth or stars or galaxies or anything. You cannot create unless you have a man and a woman. And uh, that's spiritually creating too. Spiritual creation does not happen with men and men. It can be manipulated by men and men, and it can be um, distorted which is what does happen in homosexual relationships. The energy is already there and it's distorted and used for, you know, uh, lower vibration. But creation of the light happens between a man and a woman, mm -hmm. spiritually and physical. Thanks. Thank you. you. Sorry. Yeah, you bet. You just mentioned a couple of other deeper doctrines in there. Um, I'll just let people go back and watch that if they want. But which is a nice segue to this final, I guess, introductory point about mysteries of the kingdom. So I would consider this a mystery of the kingdom. And that's what Joseph Smith alluded to when he said, if I told you all I know, you would seek to kill me. So in other words, there are mysteries or doctrines that are higher that are not to be revealed at this time in this celestial state until we have an advance in glory on this earth and then the doctrines match the glory on the earth. Read, read DNC 88 if you have any questions about that. It makes it pretty clear. But the, the point about mysteries of the kingdom is I'd like to just clarify that it, in I think it's safe to say that in LDS culture, there is a general assumption that only certain people can have access to those mysteries. And I want to just point out that it's scriptural. If you go to Doctrine and Covenants, I wish I remembered this section. I want to say 45, but if you just search for Mysteries of the Kingdom, you'll find this, this section that says the Mysteries of the Kingdom are available to those who seek it, I think. But I, whatever the conditions are, I know obedience is one of them. And this goes into the idea of 
laws and blessings are given to those who are obedient to the to the law upon which it's predicated so as you do the work and research and understand and bring your life in accordance to the laws then the knowledge and the the mysteries of the kingdom are poured out upon you even the word of wisdom mentions this idea that um, there are hidden treasures uh, hidden treasures of knowledge. It's another reference to the same idea that the mysteries of the kingdom can be opened to you when your life meets the conditions that those laws are predicated, those blessings are predicated upon. Yeah. Um, Eric, I'm being reminded um, by my friends on the other side that when you're talking, they want to see you up close. Okay. Flipping. <laughs> Whatever you're supposed to do on the camera there, they just want to make sure that when you're talking, um, you're on the big screen. Oh, okay. I've, I've been doing that. I've been doing that. Thanks okay. for the reminder. I wasn't paying attention to whether or not you were or not, but I was supposed to mention that for some reason. I'm, okay. There was a part where I didn't. I'm glad that they're interested in that and they're thinking about that and that they're helping. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I say big screen, that's what I mean. <laughs> they like to see your nice eyes looking right there. So. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay. So... It's am it's amazing, isn't it, that this is the plan that's been designed? I mean, these mysteries are exactly that, and and that's why um, it we just have to be careful when we share what we share because I don't want to do anything to infringe on Eric's agency or any of your agency. Just because I have knowledge does not mean that I have permission to share it. One of Lucifer's favorite things to do is to give knowledge to people and puff up their ego and pride and like, um, like curiosity. And then he knows they're kind of accountable and he'll, he'll put lies in there, but he'll put a lot of truth. He'll anymore. I'm seeing him tell more truth than lies, which resonates with people, uh -huh. but, but they, um, I'm getting hit in the throat, but they're, they're not discerning the 1% that's off or the 2% that's off or the 5% that's off or the 0.05% that's off because so much resonates as truth to them, mm -hmm. which is why we have, you know, billions of people in Eastern Asia in, that for, for generations have passed down reincarnation. At one point in time, that doctrine was taught by Christ mm -hmm. And then they, the Buddhists took it off the earth and they, they taught reincarnation. Um, if you talk from anybody that studies any of the Eastern religions, you know, it's, it's been covered up and revisionist history. And so um, these mysteries, you know, quite honestly, do you need to know them while you live on earth? It depends on what your plan is. It depends right. on where you are in your progression. Mm -hmm. I mean, if if you're in your fourth estate, which we'll go into later on another podcast, what some of this means, then then you you you're probably kind of ready for it. But if this is your first time on Earth, you know, learning about the the doctrines of salvation, the way that the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints teaches it is exactly what people need because what they need is to come to earth in their first experience with a body in school and get their first ordinances in mortality that they need and then they will go to the other side of the veil and they'll be prepared for their next experience they can choose do they want to go back again or do they want to go to um, whatever kingdom they have progressed to mm -hmm. and so and people always have that agency and no one forces them to come to earth and no one will keep them from coming to uh -huh. earth. Uh -huh. That's how agency goes. This plan that we have is individual. It's not tied to our spouses. It's not tied to our parents. It's not tied to our children. It is an individual plan of salvation. We are tied together as a family in a big tapestry and we are sealed. But just because our, our spouse is doing something doesn't mean that it's it's going to hold us back and we aren't going to hold them back, right? That's a lie the adversary tells. So let's let go of these fears that we have, you know, that we're not perfect or we're never going to make it. People find out of multiple probations and one of the biggest things is they're like, but this life is so hard, I don't ever want to do this again. Well, mm -hmm. guess what? That's why we have a veil. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's why we have a veil. <laughs> 
And those of you that have a veil more than mine, you're very lucky. That's one of the reasons I say, be thankful for your veil and quit complaining about it. Um, it's, it's a blessing that we have it. It's a beautiful plan. And um, what is so great when I do these sessions and I see on the other side of the veil and uh, we're clearing energy and I can see people moving into the light and I see them in different parts of spirit realm or different types of dimensions and I see them on different celestial planets. I've seen people that have been in different dimensions on different celestial planets for eons and eons. And then they decide, I think I'd like to try mortality again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they do. And some people take, you know, a thousand years to go from a celestial to a terrestrial state. Some people take 6,000 years. And for all I know, some people take a million years. I have no idea how long, but I just know that people, it's the whole spectrum. Mm -hmm. And we don't need to be panicking that we're not going to make it into the gate because, you know, or that our children or our spouses or whatever that aren't on the path, right? We just need to be moving forward. Yeah. Right. Anyway, I feel strongly about that because there's spirit tactics that are used in the church, in the culture that have been adopted down. Yeah. And I talk to clients all the time that are so depressed and so upset and so fearful because their children are struggling or their spouses yeah. have a porn problem or somebody's gay or right. It's like, just let go of the fear and trust in the plan. Yep. Yep. Trust the plan. The plan works. Thank you, Julie. If I could just add my two bits there. I remember learning the plan of salvation at church when I was young and loving it. You know, it resonated with me. I became naturally interested in it. But I remember at a very young age being frustrated by the idea that once you lived a life and you were judged, you were sentenced to a place for eternity with no opportunity for progression. I'm just saying, and I, I think a lot of people resonate or don't resonate with that idea. I think they know better. Like what, like they know their father wouldn't be so, I guess, locked in. Right. Right. And, and so there's, there's not these hard and fast rules. Yes. Yes. And so it gives me, it's given me a lot of hope as I've come to, to see the, the, tr the true story. And, and let me just mention this. As I was asking this, why I, I asked this question one day of the, the spirit in my mind as I was having a conversation. Why isn't this taught in the church? Other than what I've already said about this being a celestial state and this being a terrestrial doctrine. It doesn't fit on the earth right now very well. And, and immediately this answer came that I thought was very profound. Because the church isn't teaching, or sorry, the church is teaching the plan of salvation as it should be, and this this belongs to the plan of exaltation. This is a this is a doctrine of exaltation, not a plan, not a doctrine of salvation. So think think on that. Right. Yeah. Right. The church teaches the plan of happiness, the plan of salvation right. in those missionary lessons. That's exactly right. And for salvation. <laughs> mm-hmm. The Lord had to atone and be resurrected, and we have to have a premortal realm in spirit, and then we have to get a body, and then we go home, quote, wherever home is, or back to the spirit world is not even home. We don't even go home for salvation. Salvation does not mean you're going home. Salvation means that your body will never be separated from your spirit again. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, this is the plan of exaltation that we're talking about. This is the doctrine of eternal lives that we're talking about. That's where multiple probations comes in, multiple estates comes in. This is not this is not the same thing as just uh, the basics of the plan of salvation. I'm yeah. glad you specified that because people people are confused about it. Yeah. And it's not required that you live more than one life to be saved. You don't have to do that. Right. Agency is always critical, right? In the plan. Yeah. Yeah. So, Julie, I have, I'm just kind of thinking out loud here. Time's going to run short on us. I. What if we, I want to go through a few scriptures. I know some people have been interested in what scriptures sort of support the idea of, of these this doctrine. And then can we both share our... Um, witness or something special to us about how this doctrine um, came to have meaning in our in our lives is that okay sure. sure okay so here's some scriptures i want the first one is john 9 2 i'm going to post notes again like other podcasts so you can go and research these if you want uh and his disciples asked him saying master who did sin this man or his parents that he was born blind okay pause right there 
How can someone sin before they're born? Okay, that's just a thought. Next one, Matthew 16, 14, 15. Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Okay, pause. Why are the people asking who Jesus is? They know he's Jesus. Why are they asking this? They, they did the same sort of thing with John the Baptist. Um, and this is John 1, 19 through 25. And this is the record of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask, Who art thou? Okay, pause there again. Why are they asking John the Baptist, who is famous, who he is? <laughs> He's John the Baptist. Right. And they do it in the Book of Mormon, too. If you look at how many times somebody thinks that so-and-so, like Ammon or whoever, is the great spirit, why would they think that a mortal man is the great spirit? Julie, I have not right? made that connection. That's beautiful. <laughs> well You're welcome. <laughs> it's it's laced throughout the Book of Mormon. You just have to know what you're looking for. Yeah. Because it's not just Ammon. You look at all of the Antichrist and what was their big thing? So-and-so, I don't believe in the Great Spirit. And so-and-so, you know, are they, aren't the Great Spirit? Some say he is, some say he isn't. And then why why is it so matter of fact that they that those that were, you know, thought to be the Great Spirit would say, no, I'm not the Great Spirit, don't worship me, Right. And why do we have these records all over the, uh, these people, like Captain Cook's uh, records and like the islands and all this of Christ visiting all these places and these people that have heard about Christ coming for years and some of them having records of him having been there before. Mm -hmm. So like it's so tied in to this this estate um, doctrine. Yeah. You just have it. But the scriptures are layered and they are there are mysteries and even if you go back and read the dnc you go back and read the book of mormon with being open-minded to the doctrine of eternal lives as being the doctrine of exaltation and living multiple estates and you will have your eyes opened to how many times it's actually alluded to or even flat out mentioned in both the book of mormon pearl of the great price and doctrine and covenants and then, and then that's not even counting the Bible because it's in the Bible too. And then if you start reading these other records, Mentinah records and Philippine records, undeniable witnesses from people through all generations of time. Yeah, really well said. And that's not even talking about the Mayans and the Incas and, and the Buddhists and the Hindus. Yes. Right? I mean, how many, how many different groups of people on this planet do we need to have witnesses from that there's something to this mm -hmm. before we're going to open our hearts and minds to it? Because you know, somebody culturally passed down that that's a wicked doctrine. Yes. Right? So. <laughs> well said. Very well said. Anyway. I like it when you get on those rants. <laughs> rants not the right word, but you, those those just live feeds from heaven. Thank you. I'm I will say, you know, it's not all bad that we've been protected. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it's been a protection for us. Because can you imagine if for the last 200 years the adversary knew that we knew some of who we were like it's really a good thing and and it's only i believe it's not revealed to you until you're ready to yes. know it yeah uh, as a tender mercy from the lord so if this isn't resonating with you that's okay it doesn't mean i'm wrong it doesn't mean eric's wrong it just means it might not be time it's to not time it that's it absolutely yeah well said but you know just put on a shelf instead of cast stones right yeah yeah let me go back to John the Baptist one. If you if you finish and go look at that scripture and then read the Joseph Smith translation on it, you'll see it says, um, when they asked if John the Baptist was Elias, um, art thou that prophet? He said, no. Right. And then they said, who art thou? That we, we may give an answer to them that sent us. What sayest thou of thyself? If you read the Joseph Smith translation, it says, and he denied them not that he was Elias. Which which leaves right. the field wide open. Is it possible that John the Baptist was actually Elias? <laughs> right. And there's Elias the title, and then there's Elias the person, just right. to clarify. Mm. And, I mean, the same thing with Joseph of Egypt. They were asking about Joseph as well, and, um, and Joseph Smith. And so look at what is said in the scriptures about Joseph of Egypt and the lineage and Joseph Smith, and you'll see a pattern there as well. Mm -hmm. Good point. Here's another one. Um, you mentioned the Book of Mormon. I hadn't thought of that. I like it. I need to add it to my list. 
There are two references in the Book of Mormon to the word condescensions in the plural form. Those are worth studying. It's Second okay. Nephi 9.53 and Jacob 4.7 saying Christ's condescensions. And I With an would, S. Yes. Um, another okay. one, Joseph Smith Matthew. Now, this, this is a, a strange one. I believe it's real. And some people may think that this is a stretch. I believe it's legit. If you read Joseph Smith Matthew and you look at the pronouns in there as the Savior speaking to his disciples, in the, um, in the first half of that chapter, he's using third person, saying they, them, their. And in the second half, when he's speaking of the days of tribulation in the latter days, he changes to first person. And he says, you, you, I love that. <laughs> you will be there. You will um, see this. You will see that. So uh, to me, it's a, it's a dead giveaway. I think the um, translators and those people in Constantine's time missed the pronouns. And I'm kind of glad they did. <laughs> um Anyway, what, um, one more one more thought here. This comes from the New Testament. When the Savior was crucified and resurrected, he came back and visited people several times. Um, of course, Mary Magdalene was the first that he appeared to. There was um, the road to Emmaus. He appeared to, uh, oh, anyway, I, I can't remember names. I'm not real fresh right now, but there was always this, this hesitation to recognize who he was. And even his own disciples, when they were fishing, there was, right? So here are three scriptures, Luke 24, 16, John 21, 7, John 20, 15, are cases where those who were very close to him hesitated. Why did they hesitate? Can I answer this right now, Julie? I have some beliefs and thoughts about why they hesitated, why they did not recognize him. Do you want to, Julie? I do too. Uh, no, you go first, and then I'll add mine. Simply that, as a as a now resurrected being, which Christ hadn't done before, as I understand, um, had on this earth, right? Uh, on this earth, had had previous probations, and therefore previous physical identities, and and so when he came back as a resurrected being. I think there's always an assumption that he looked exactly like he did in mortality as Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And um, who's to say he didn't look like one of his other probations or perhaps a combination of them or something and and had the likeness of Jesus that they all knew, but, but maybe and the some... Energy, and the energy. And the energy, but some structural features of the face were, were slightly different. And... Um, kind of like, you know, recognizing somebody you haven't seen in 20 years. They aged a little, they matured, they grew, they, but there's still that air of familiarity there. And so I submit that as a possibility of why he wasn't readily recognized by those who loved him. Right. Well, especially Mary Magdalene. I mean, this was her husband. First of all, she was caught off guard that he was there. But also, I mean, was she really? Because why did she go to the tomb? She was hoping, I mean... He had told her that he would rise again in three days. And she went on the third day, hoping to see him. And then when the when she realized the tomb was empty, it started to come together for her. And then when, I've seen this through her eyes, when she looks up and sees him, she's also sobbing her eyes out. And she's kind of distracted in that sorrow and grief. And um, when she looks up, she kind of blinks her eyes and does this like, whoa whoa, it's really you, you know? Um, and it did. It took her a few minutes to gain her composure and to, um, I mean, she, she literally blinked a few times through the tears. And then that's when she wanted to reach out and hug him. And he said, you know, not yet. Not yet. You can't hug me yet. Um, I don't have enough words to describe that moment for her. Um and I think the doctrines that they had discussed started to come together for her. Um, that doctrine of eternal lives and resurrection and what that meant for her and uh, her mission and what the Lord had counseled with her in before he was going to be crucified and what she was being asked to do to carry forth doctrines and 
uh, truths to basically carry the church forward after his death. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Julie, when I... <clears throat> we can close now. Thank you for that. When I learned about this doctrine, I don't know, three years ago, two years, two and a half, three years ago, my immediate reaction was, I know this is true. Oh, crap. I don't want to do this again. And I went into a state of depression because I knew it was true. The Spirit instantly witnessed it to me. But then I had to wrestle with the idea of going through more mortalities. And I had this sacred experience. I, I went into a prayer. I was on my knees asking the Lord, Lord, this is hard for me. I know this is true. I'm having a hard time. Can you help me? And then the Spirit put these words in my mind. And I was grateful. And it said, pray this, ask this. But, Lord, if you can help me understand who I've been or what I've done for you in the past and any of my probations, and if I've been of any value or have had merit to you in the king in building the kingdom, please make it known to me, and it might give me the strength to move forward. Within days, names started coming to my mind, and witnesses from from Julie and some others close to me gave me the witnesses I needed, and the piece puzzle pieces started coming forward and coming together and clarity clarity came and I have a greater stronger witness of who I am and what I'm supposed to do knowing those people that I've been has given me a clear pattern a tapestry that Julie's been talking about that lets me know what the Lord has wanted me to do in in my mission and my purpose on the earth and I'm so grateful that it came to me that way um uh, that's I'll just leave mine there and just turn it to you Julie Thank you, Eric. Mm-hmm. I remember having those conversations with Eric, and I can testify to you that he's telling the truth. Um, I know he felt a great weight, and actually anguish is the word that comes to mind when he discovered uh, the doctrine and when he, the Spirit witnessed to him that it was a true doctrine. Uh, the adversary, you know, brings in emotions of overwhelm and unworthiness and fear of failure and all these emotions to try to keep us from from progressing. Um, For me, uh, I woke up in 2004 with memories of my eternal identity and my role and what the Lord was asking me to do. And um, for the better part of 10 years, I would come in and out of that with uh, the Spirit saying things. and then in the last five years, I'd have an adversarial attack. I'd end up on the other side of the veil, and they would reiterate again. And I had so many witnesses uh, of what I agreed to do premortally at all costs that I cannot deny it, or I would be denying my Savior and his plan of exaltation. Yes. That is how strongly I feel about this doctrine. That is how strongly I feel about my role and mission in this life and into the eternities that they've made known to me. I know who my master is. I know who I work for, and it is the Savior, Jesus Christ, and I will do it at all costs. It's he that I answer to and a father, and uh, and quite frankly, to all of Elohim. And I answer to those who I serve, which means as my brothers and sisters, I owe you the truth and my witness and testimony that this is true doctrine. There is still much much that needs to be revealed. It is not yet time. But I am grateful that we got permission to finally share some of our witness and testimony, as there are so many that are starting to wake up to their own memories of premortality. Their gifts are increasing like it says they would in the book of Joel. And... Um, I have had literally hundreds of witnesses since my um, my own knowledge has come of my identity. And I want to thank those who have served as witnesses to me because you have been a strength and helped me 
So I can be bold and I can go forward in faith and now in some knowledge, knowing that um, the light side is absolutely working on our behalf, that this plan is rolling forward, both the plan of salvation and the plan of exaltation. I am grateful for the Lord and his goodness. I am grateful for this plan. It is absolutely phenomenal. I can't describe to you enough the intricacies of the details involved in the plan of salvation and especially the plan of exaltation. It is worth it. It is beautiful. It's magnificent. And uh, just what I have learned thus far is uh, it can be and often is overwhelming for me. But every single time um, I am given comfort, I'm given guidance, and I'm given as I stretch myself and I ask those questions and then I stay the course, then little by little, line upon line, I get confirmation from things that they've been telling me for my whole life. Mm. And um, so I'm thankful that we're here at this point in the plan. I want to let you know that I'm dedicated to the plan at all costs that I work on behalf of the light side. I always have, and I always will. And I will do all in my power to gather this family. I love you. I love, I love the human family. I see so much potential in every single one of you, wherever you are, the ones that I can see and the ones that I feel and the ones that I hear. And for those that I have not yet met, I look forward to the day that I can meet you. I give you my witness that Father in Heaven and the Savior Jesus Christ are real, that they hear you, they see you, they feel you, and they are there for you. Call upon them and ask them those tough questions so that you can have a witness of these things for yourself. And I leave this with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.